it's been over 50 years since the United States sent the first humans to the moon in what was a highly competitive space race between the U.S. and the former USSR. We choose to go to the moon and dislocate and do the other things. There's a race happening right now to take over outer space in the 21st century. Now there's a renewed interest to return to the moon, with many more global players involved. The dominance of the United States over space exploration is being massively challenged for the first time since their original contest with the Soviet Union back in the 1960s. And this new contender is not here to mess around. They are making aggressive plans and they are turning those words into actions and accomplishments, a key point that NASA has struggled with for a long time now. China has a much better chance of winning the space race than most Americans realize and this is something that we need to be talking about. More specifically, this is a competition to see who can establish a permanent base at the lunar south pole, which is an area believed to be flush with critical resources such as water that would support a long-term human presence on the moon. In one corner, we have the Artemis program. This is a joint effort between the United States, Canada, Japan and Europe, among many other smaller agencies who have signed onto the Artemis Accords, the newest of which being India, which is very important to note because just recently we watched India successfully land the first robotic lander at the lunar south pole. So this is a powerful coalition of nations, though let's not pretend that this isn't an American first operation. The U.S. wrote the Artemis Accords and the entire program was set into motion by President Trump in 2017. Trump was also responsible for formally establishing the United States Space Force, which is still a silly name, but is actually something that was very much needed for this new era of space competition. The U.S. military has obviously been involved in the space program from the very beginning, but by creating a dedicated branch focused on outer space activities, it shows the world that this is something the U.S. takes seriously, or at least as serious as you can be taken. With a name like Space Force. Anyway, the United States must remain first in space in this century as in the last, not just to propel our economy and secure our nation, but above all, because the rules and values of space like every great frontier will be written by those who have the courage to get there. First, and the commitment to stay. China had shown the world that they could do something in outer space that no one else had done before. And while landing a robot on the moon in the 21st century might not sound like such a massive accomplishment, keep in mind that in the time since China we've seen India, Japan and now even Russia attempt to land their own robotic missions and fail to even touch down successfully on the moon. Every attempt resulted in a crash landing and destruction of the payload until just last week when India succeeded on their second attempt. And to drive home the fact that this was no fluke, China went on to succeed with Chang'e 5 in November 2020. This was a complex mission involving an orbiter, lander, rover, and a sample return vehicle that launched moon rock into space and transported it back to Earth. That was the first time people had returned a sample from the moon since the mid-1970s. And what we've seen so far from the Chinese is just the tip of their lunar iceberg. This is a plan that China has been working on since 2004, a three-phase lunar expansion program and the current robotic missions are only phase one. We are less than a year away from the launch of Chang'e 6 which will be China's second excursion to the far side of the moon and more significantly this mission will attempt the first ever sample return from the moon's far side. They are probably not going to discover something unknown over there. The only difference between the two halves of the moon is that one side is always visible from the earth and the other side is never visible from the earth. But the point is that yet again China is doing something that no one else has done before and they're making damn sure that everyone, especially the United States, can see them. Do it. This will be followed up by Chang'e 7 in 2026. China's most ambitious lunar mission, consisting of an orbiter, lander, rover and hopping spacecraft designed to seek out water ice in permanently shadowed areas of the Shackleton Crater at the Lunar South Pole. The Chang'e 8 will launch two years after that in 2028 and land nearby Chang'e 7 carrying a robot designed to test 3D printing bricks from Lunar Regolith. This marks the end of China's Phase 1 lunar expansion. Phase 2 is where stuff gets real. In the year 2029, China is going to land their first crew of Taika knots on the moon. And I say that this is something China is going to do and not something they are planning to do because 2029 will mark the 80th anniversary for the People's Republic of China and there is no doubt that the Chinese Communist Party will take this opportunity to make a colossal move on the global stage. And like we've said before, this is something that China has already planned out. 
there are three main components to a successful human landing on the moon, a heavy lift rocket, a crew vehicle and a lunar lander. We already know what these components are going to be in the context of the Artemis program, the SLS, the Orion and the Starship. China's heavy lift rocket of choice will be their upcoming long March 10th. This vehicle is currently under development with a scheduled test flight for 2027. Unlike their much more ambitious and experimental Long March 9th concept, the Long March 10th leverages existing Chinese rocket technology, namely their YF-100 kerosene engine, and this should allow for the rocket to move rapidly from the development phase to active service. Long March 10th will be a 90-meter tall, three-stage rocket that utilizes two liquid-fueled side boosters in addition to a center core booster. Each of them fitted with seven of the YF-100 engines. So Long March 10th is going to look and function very similar to a SpaceX Falcon Heavy with the capability to deliver 27 metric tons to lunar orbit. China also has a plan to make the three booster cores reusable by having them complete a propulsive landing, again very similar to a Falcon Heavy, except instead of landing legs, China wants to catch the booster with a system of tightrope-like wire tethers. The next key component is known as the Next Generation Crewed Spacecraft, and this is essentially a Chinese equivalent of NASA's Orion spacecraft that is being used for the Artemis missions. The capsule supports a three-person crew and includes a service module for power and propulsion, while this vehicle is still in development, trying to begin full-scale prototype testing. As early as 2016. The third component is China's Lunar Lander. This will allow two astronauts to reach the surface of the moon and then return to orbit again. This vehicle is also under development. Now because the long March 10th will only be rated for 27 tons to lunar orbit, the execution of this plan will require two separate rocket launches, one long March 10th to send the crewed spacecraft and a second long March 10th to deliver the lunar lander. Then the two vehicles will rendezvous and dock in lunar orbit for crew transfer. It's a pretty similar outline to the Artemis 3 mission profile. Much like the old Apollo missions, the first Chinese stay on the moon will be relatively short. Just around 6 to 8 hours of exploration, sample collection, and conducting experiments, this will include the use of an electric lunar rover that will have 10 kilometers of driving range. This China thing isn't really that big of a deal because NASA is going to be landing people on the moon by 2025 and they'll have a full Artemis moon base in progress by the time China even arrives. I don't think there's any well-informed person in the space community who honestly believes that we are landing on the moon in 2025. The signs of progress are just not there right now. SLS and Orion have flown one test mission which was very successful. That's good. The SpaceX Starship which is being counted on as our human landing system has also made one test flight which was not successful. Obviously, there's nothing easy about making a lunar-capable super heavy-lift rocket but if you were to put them on a spectrum, SLS would be right around moderate difficulty level while Starship is maxed out in sanity levels of difficult. Plus, we've already seen the first NASA officials winding up to throw SpaceX under the bus for delaying the Artemis 3 landing. NASA Associate Administrator Jim Free recently hinted that Artemis May 3rd have to go ahead without a moon landing. Free said that NASA might change the mission parameters to something more viable. SpaceX needs to figure out how to get Starship into orbit which is going to be very difficult but they can probably do it. Then they need to figure out how to get the gigantic upper stage back down from space in one piece and stick the propulsive landing. Then SpaceX needs to figure out their orbital gas station and tanker ship system. Then they need to build a variation of the Starship that can land on the moon and keep two people alive there for five days. Then they need to get that Starship all the way to the moon and land on it. And then they need to do that flawlessly enough that NASA decides it is safe to try again with people on board. So there is a non-zero chance that the Chinese will beat NASA to the first crewed moon landing of the 21st century. China sent its youngest ever crew to its orbiting space station today as the country reiterated plans to put astronauts on the moon by the end of the decade. We need to get to the moon, humanity needs to get to the moon in order to learn how to live in space, in order to learn how to utilize the resources of space. Whoever gets to establish a significant lunar presence is making a statement about their political system, about their economic system, about who is ahead in the geopolitical competition. But a second newer part to this is to believe that there are significant resources on the moon that are useful to Earth or useful for future spaceflight. And so this day is still the only nation to have landed people on the moon. 
spacecraft's sense of the moon are typically categorized into several mission types. A flyby mission passes close to the moon, but does not go into orbit around the moon. An orbiter mission allows the spacecraft to go around the moon continually taking detailed photos or radar images of it. A hard landing mission is where a probe crashes into the moon. Those can be intentional, with the impact kicking up the breeze that can then be analyzed, often by the instruments of an orbiter spacecraft, or unintentional, when an attempted soft landing goes awry. Soft landings are typically the most challenging and costly missions, as the spacecraft must make it to the surface of the moon with its structure and instruments fully intact. And globally, more than 100 lunar missions are expected to take place by 2030. A major reason for this renewed interest in going back to the moon was finding concrete evidence of a valuable natural resource. When we thought that the moon was really just sort of barren and had nothing, the concept of sending somebody to the moon and trying to keep that person alive was just costly, expensive, and there didn't seem to be a benefit. But now we have water, so we can send people to the moon and we can support them on the moon without having to send water up. An area that scientists think is the most likely to contain large reserves of water. We're pretty sure there's water on the moon, we're pretty sure that most of it is in these very, deep craters on the lunar south pole because no sunlight ever gets to them. Aside from being crucial for human survival, water can be used to make rocket fuel by splitting its components, oxygen and hydrogen, and liquefying them. NASA is using this fuel type in its new SLS rocket that will launch astronauts back to the moon. With access to water, the moon could one day become a refueling station for rockets and a springboard for deeper space exploration. The presence of water on the moon and access to its other resources have motivated a number of nations and commercial companies to explore it. On the heels of its own successful unmanned moon landing, India has also said that it plans to put an astronaut on the moon by 2040. But the biggest competition is between the United States and China, and who can set up a presence on the moon first. Once you have a human presence, you start establishing rules, that's just human nature. The U.S. effort to return to the moon is known as Artemis. The program is spearheaded by NASA in conjunction with a number of commercial and international partners, and is expected to cost the country over $93 billion through 2025. Artemis is all about getting people back to the moon for long duration, so eventually we want to get people on the surface of the moon for up to 30 days. And it's first about science. We want to understand the south pole of the moon, which is where we're flying to. And we also want to test our systems close to home in a partial gravity environment before we send crews onto Mars. As has become the norm, NASA is working with a number of commercial partners to build out its Artemis infrastructure. NASA's first mission, Artemis 1, took place in 2022 and tested NASA's Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft, which will eventually carry astronauts to lunar orbit. More recently, NASA, in partnership with commercial company Astrobotic, launched the country's first lunar lander in decades, though it suffered a technical anomaly shortly after launch. The Artemis II mission, which was originally scheduled for November 2024, but has since been pushed back to September 2025, will launch for astronauts into orbit around the Moon, before Artemis III returns astronauts to the Moon's surface in September 2026. Getting back to the Moon is very hard and getting to the South Pole's even harder. Creating deep space systems to function for 21 days in orbit, 30 days on the surface, it takes time to prove that out. As part of its Artemis objectives, NASA is working to build a space station that will orbit the Moon as well as establish a base camp on the Moon's surface. We've talked about setting up something called the Lunar Gateway Station, so that would be in a space station that would in fact be manned all the time, that orbit the Moon, and every so often you would then see a crew go from the Lunar Gateway Station to the lunar surface, where they presumably would have shelters and habitats and things like that. Meanwhile, China is a relative newcomer to the space race, with the country not having conducted a manned space flight until 2003. But China has since made tremendous progress. The country built its own Earth orbiting station after Congress banned all scientific collaboration between NASA and China in 2011, meaning China lost access to the International Space Station. China has also announced plans to build its own research station on the lunar surface, and has said it wants to put astronauts on the moon by around 2030. United States aerospace leadership has expressed concerns about China's moon ambitions, especially if the country were to establish a presence on the moon before the U.S.
I think the space race is really between us and China, and we need to protect the interest of the international community. But before any nation can establish a presence on the moon or claim its riches, they have to overcome some tough challenges. For China, the big challenges are, this is brand new, and they are still developing some of the key technologies associated. For example, a heavy lift booster to lift the space capsule and crew and consumables that be necessary not only to go to the moon, but obviously to bring them back. The Chinese approach is one based on long-term planning with programmatic stability. We have had repeated studies and projects and exploratory conditions on not only going back to the moon, but also going to Mars. But despite the challenges facing individual countries as they continue to push the boundaries of what we can do in space. The exploration and use of space by treaty, by the Outer Space Treaty, is supposed to be for the benefit of all. And we can make it that way, competition isn't necessarily a bad thing. We need to have a lot of countries excited because this is our first step as a human race versus as a Chinese person, an American person. We need to stop thinking about ourselves in that way and space is the way we're going to do that. When this is all said and done, the Chinese will have one hell of a moon base for themselves and their growing host of international partners to begin advanced human operations on the moon. And at the same time, NASA is proposing to do something with their Artemis program. This is the worrying point, aside from the construction of their orbital gateway station, which is awesome, NASA hasn't really provided the same level of detail on just how they are going to go about creating their own moon bases. And as we've seen, any time NASA does try and make a plan, it almost immediately falls apart and gets delayed, modified and confused. But when it comes to making very complex and expensive long-term plans, like colonizing the moon and actually following through with them, we've got to admit that an authoritarian model like the Chinese Communist Party does have a clear advantage in this area. So there is a very real chance that the Chinese will win this new space race in this decade. And we've got to at the very least start preparing ourselves for whatever the consequences of that power shift might be.